First, I will show this very famous picture uh, from a Harold Kahn's book. Most of you know it, but I think it <coughs> would be suitable this morning here. Uh, not everything that, that looks like hepatic encephalopathy is so. So uh, what you look like and what you feel like is not necessarily hepatic encephalopathy. It's post is the post Galatina syndrome. It's not the same. After that, we'll move on. And I have no disclosures. And um, this word translational research uh, came on the market, so to speak, about 25 years ago uh, because people realized that there's a huge stumbling block between basic research and making research useful. So this term was coined as translational uh, research and it has been, nobody could write an application since then without starting with this word. And uh, it, it became a buzzword, so to speak. But now it's been taken over by more other fashion words. Uh, one of the worst, in my opinion, is innovative. Uh, but they also have, have a multidisciplinary and groundbreaking and so on and so forth. But, um, but uh, translational research is still there and I think it has some meaning to it. And um, so I've been thinking about it. Also because, I have to, because I'm on the board of committee of Europe's biggest and richest private research society, the Novo Nordisk Foundation. And we have all the time to discuss between us, among us, what are the principles for handing out all that money? So we talk about translational research. And also, as you can see in this picture, it's, um, it's uh, close to our hearts in our department at home. This is our uh, department signature painting uh, and our department slogan. So you see, it is actually about uh, translational research. This is Peter Ott writing uh, signs here to combat the bad liver diseases over there. Um, and you know, translational research even now has its own dedicated uh, journal. It's called the Marin Journal of Translational Research. And what I'm going to discuss with you after this, I have simply scissored uh, from the wonderful editorials of that, uh, of that uh, journal. So I have something to declare on the list. And um, now let's go to what it is about. It is about making... <laughs> It's about taking care of this scientific practical dichotomy uh, that, if we do it correctly, may become translational medicine. And you see, the problem was that it appeared that there was a gap between basic research and clinical research. And uh, there was an idea that this gap could be removed so that uh, uh, basic research could be made useful to the patients within a very short time. That has been a huge disappointment. Uh, because uh, contrary to all this, the gap seems to be widening. And uh, things are going on in both camps that don't talk well together. You see, the, at that time we co coined this uh, expression from bench to bed. Uh, this appeared to be a misconception because it should have been the other way around from, from bed to bench and usually back, of course. So that's why in the pictures to, to come I have swapped it with the clinical first. But the definition that most people can agree on concerning uh, by, uh, by uh, translational research is that it's biomedical research. It, it can, of course, also be marketing research of such things, but in our context, it's biomedical research aiming to make findings from basic science <coughs> useful for practical applications that enhance human wealth and well being. Okay, that sounds good. That's more or less the official uh, definition, and that's what we talk about. Uh, already now I have to make uh, some terminology clear here because we are talking about basic research, medical knowledge and clinical practice. And what is it that you prefer to call translational research? Some people call this step for translational research. We in the clinic tend to call this step uh, translational research. But what I think we should talk about is trans uh, translational medicine that covers all the way. And in, what I in the pictures to come, I will talk about translational medicine to make it clear. You have to remember that we always think that the stumbling block is huge here and it takes up a huge amount of resources and time, but it's exactly as large and as time and resource consuming in the latter part of it. But what I, what I mean is translational medicine that covers all the spectrum. And um, 
What's the difference between uh, the two disciplines, clinical research and basic research? Yeah, uh, the clinical research are always driven by human problems. That's what drives us clinicians to do research and systematic work with our, pro with our uh, patients' problems. We always have specific endpoints. They have to wake up, they have to go home, they have to survive or whatever. Uh, but the execution of the clinical work is painfully slow. Um, and uh, you know how, how, how long time it takes to make the most simple uh, clinical trial. And uh, on the other side, uh, here in the basic research, it's often driven by quite other motives. It may be one of the more negative ones I've written here is practicability. You, some people in, in the labs do it because they can do it. They have the technology for this and that, and then they do it. It may also be driven by personal curiosity and so on and so forth, which may be a bit better. And it may also be speculative. It's not uh, rooted in the same practical problems as in here. But on the other hand, they can make a huge amount of experiments in vitro in a hurry. And that's a huge difference. So you can see here the potentials of the clinical research is probably, in fact, limited to incremental progress. As you know, it really comes in small, small pieces. And, um, but on the other hand, the, the impact on practice may be relatively short if we're careful and make our homework. On the other hand, the basic research may really lead to breakthroughs. But however good these breakthroughs are, they are invariably highly delayed with their impact on clinical practice. So that's other characteristics and the potentials, as I think most people talk about it. And um, challenges. Why don't we combine the potentials of the two disciplines? There are many problems here. One other thing is that to use translation in, in the linguistic sense of the word, there are many, it's an ambiguous word, but in this context it's mostly uh, the linguistic meaning. Both sides need a defined language. And you know, for example, concerning hepatic encephalopathy, we are only now approaching a language, so conditions are difficult. And it's the same in the labs. They have the most terrible terminology for all things, and it changes all the time. So we need defined languages so as to making translations. And also, there should really be a crime to translate. It's not enough to say we'll do it. It, 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 requ it requires a high level of motivation to do it, because it's difficult. And also, the cultural differences in the labs and at the bedside is are very, very large and underrated. And also, out in the system, people get, tend to get more reward for individual efforts than for teams. And teams is, a, is the assumption of this sort of work here. And that's something we have to realize. And also, it seems to be an obstacle, they write in, in this paper, that journals require tight control of experimental conditions. And if you work across the whole spectrum, it's really difficult to to maintain that high level of uh, description of control of the experimental conditions. And uh, there are also large practical problems to integrate these amounts of data of highly different provenience. It, they, they're really difficult to handle on a, on a data management level. And um, you need organization on a high, large scale level. And the informatics systems are I, I should have written usually inadequate to, to solve the solution. So there are really challenges uh, uh, for doing this that sounds so easy. And so <clears throat> you see what is required is multi-skilled teams. But they only, uh, they have, it's not enough that uh, they have multidisciplinary collaboration as this new password. They also have to be multi-skilled. And um, you have to establish what they call knowledge-driven ecosystems that stick together because the common amount of knowledge and wish to expand that knowledge. That's what they call a knowledge-driven ecosystem. And the, the, the teams should attain a capability of generating, contributing, managing and analyzing data. High requirement, but it's necessary to get all the way through. And um, that is the requirements. And, and what's the goal of it all? Why, why should we do it, or why would we consider doing it? It would be wonderful to create a continuous data feed, a feedback loop. 
running this way and this way or whatever. That's the goal of it actually, and that's what the richness of it comes from if, if we success. And, and the, the result should be that we accelerate translation of data into knowledge and make basic and clinical findings useful. That's the goal of it all, and it sounds very good, but as I indicated, it's not so easy. And um, there is also a lot to criticize about translational research. Uh, it, it's not, it, it, it has some problems. For example, it's very clear that the important discoveries in the history of medicine arose in labs, not so much at the bedside. That goes for drugs and basic biological facts. Oh, uh, and uh, people also look back in the history of translational research and say, is history with it? What very good, good things of important progress come, came out of it? And it's not so easy to answer, actually. And, um, and then there's also the question of cost. For example, lots of people claim that it's much or it's only cost effective to support lab work because of the possibility of breakthroughs. That will never come in the clinical research probably. So in, 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 a, in, in my in Novo Nordisk Foundation, it's not so easy to convince these others that they should support such things. They say it's not cost effective, Henry. And uh, they, may, they may be right. Uh, you, can, you can see here, yeah, I have written about that. Uh, and furthermore, this way of doing research has never been subjected to any sort of evidence-based evaluation. So it's not, it's not sure it's, 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 it's useful, actually. And it's very often accused of uh, uh, resulting in results that cannot be reproduced. So these are the criticisms about it. And there are several more, but I think um, it may be thought-provoking for us to see that actually uh, many people with big grants say that uh, it's simply not cost-effective. So why should we do translational research on medicine for hepatic encephalopathy? Because this condition is a challenge in both camps. We know that. We hear that uh, during this meeting here. And also, I think we are obliged to do it because looking 50 years back, there has been no breakthrough in any camp. We are both, both camps are making very small progress and, and very slow. So I think we have to do it simply. Uh, and um, a, a breakthrough in one of those single disciplines is actually unlikely. We know that now. And, um, and, and, and we also miss new basic paradigms to work with. And they will probably come from the, the, uh, from the basic science. And uh, we miss innovative, I use that word now, interventions for trials. You see, we make so many trials on generically identical principles. It brings us nowhere. We need new interventions. And uh, also I think that we should be able to overcome the challenges because for people interested in this area, uh, some grounds are laid for the translation. And I think that we may also be able to counter some of the criticisms I listed before exactly uh, in relation to HE. So I think we should do it and I think we're obliged to do it actually. And we need to do it. And uh, what do we need? We need, without any doubt, more feedback from clinicians to labs. That is really important. I think that's one of the stumble blocks in this part of it. And uh, we, we need systematic, systematic efforts to translate, to understand one another's language and to speak clearly in our own language and try to understand what the others are saying. We need reciprocal education. You, you know, most of the patients being treated for hepatic encephalopathy are treated by doctors that are not completely sure about the difference between glutamine and glutamate. And many of the people working in the labs seem not to know the concentration of ammonia in our patients. So we need some sort of uh, education here. So one suggestion is to set up, that's why I try in my, in my own uh, Novo Nordisk uh, Foundation, to set up tandem programs driven by one half senior a basic scientist and one half senior clinical scientist running a program together. Uh, so, and we need more science, less market. 
it does not help us to do these uh, generic clinical trials. It doesn't bring us on. It may be good for the market, but it's not good for science. And also, we might think about whether it's useful to go to all these big uh, conferences where we talk with 8,000 people who think the same way. Shouldn't we rather go and visit the labs and, uh, or the labs go and visit us? So more exchange would be useful rather than all the conferences. And actually we need more Asian, I put up there, because one of the only fora I know in this field where people with basic interests and clinical interests meet and talk together is actually the Asian. So I think that's one of the raison d'etre of the Asian, and, and we should strengthen that, I think. So, I'll show you a small example. No, no, th this isn't a, that was, now I'm doing a small um, interactive exercise. <laughs> How many of you present here know of the garbage truck of the brain? The garbage truck. It's, it's, you're cheating. I knew you knew it. Nobody sitting here know of the garbage truck of the brain. It's an interesting exercise. Because within the last few years, this so-called lymphatic system has been discovered. And, um, and it has been shown that the brain does indeed have a garbage removal system without which the brain cannot live. And it only runs while we are asleep and it's disturbed by ammonia. How comes we don't all know of this? And this jump in edit. It's just an example of a loss of translation. And you know, this is from science last year. Interesting. We heard Alexander Trani the other day, he came from that group and he talked a little about it. Fabulous, fabulous interesting thing. So that was the interactive part, now you can relax. <laughs> we tried it a little ourselves in our uh, small department because we went into a translational collaboration with the neuropharmacologists at Copenhagen University, you know, Arne, uh, Arne Skovsborg and his people, and uh, we tried to do this. And uh, we have done so for close to 10 years now and we published about 25 papers and we have had no breakthrough. We didn't get the Nobel Prize, I'm sorry to admit. <laughs> but on the other hand, it has been very, very useful nonetheless because we have made a reasonable amount of dogma cleanup concerning hepatic encephalopathy. And some of the examples you heard Susan Kiding tell about the other day, but for example, we have finally and definitively described the dynamics of brain uptake of ammonia. And we've described how the cerebral perfusion is in hepatic encephalopathy and how the oxygen uptake is and how the coupling metabolism perfusion uptake is, uh, is uh, controlled during hepatic encephalopathy. We have come more or less to the bottom of the question of brain energy metabolism. The TGA activity is not turned down and uh, the GABA tone is increased and uh, we have described other ways of getting rid of, uh, of ammonia instead of glutamine. Uh, to, to Alan in here, and um, we have described as Susanna also, also told that the low oxygen consumption resides in the neurons, not in the astrocytes as we thought. So we have made some sort of cleanup. The price of this is that we meet several times a year, sit all of us for a whole day in a small, same small room and talk and talk and talk and talk. If we don't do that, we cannot do anything together. So that's, that's the price of it. And if we're not ready to pay that price, I think we cannot do it simply. So I have my last disclosure here, namely an engagement in translation and research and medicine for hepatic encephalopathy. Thank you.